Yeah, we're back uh, on a given Monday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we're doing a series called Transitional Justice, uh, organized by Project Expedite Justice here in Hawaii. Ne? And our guest today is Tony Tate, and he is going to tell us about his connection with and his experience and lessons in um, justice in post-genocide Rwanda, a very important um, and informative subject in our time. Welcome to the show, Tony. Thanks so much, Jay. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Well, let's talk about Rwanda. Uh, in my recollection is Rwanda was really an awful time. Uh, there were atrocities galore. Uh, half a million people were killed in, a, in the space of uh, 90 days. And it's hard to really look back and figure out exactly why. Do we know why half a million people were killed there in 90 days? Well, we, what we know is that the regime in power um, was desperate to hold on to power because they were faced with um, the Rwandan Patriotic Front uh, that was coming in from neighboring Uganda. So the regime uh, was actively in a civil war um, and was very concerned about um, you know, losing their, their, their hold on power. So what they, what they did, they, what they orchestrated was to create a hate campaign against the Tutsi people in Rwanda. So just to take a step back, Jay, Rwanda is made up largely of two um, groups of people, the, the Hutus, which are the vast majority, about 85% of the population, and the Tutsis, about 15%. So this group of Tutsis who lived in Rwanda uh, uh, prior and during the genocide uh, were uh, vilified by the government. Um, and they stirred up all kinds of claims of, you know, these people are going to take over, they're going to take your land, they're going to kill you unless you kill them first. So you had a media campaign that was going on, you had a government that was training militias to kill, and you had uh, people in the government who had imported uh, some um, firearms, but mostly machetes and knives for people to use to commit the genocide. So this was all leading up to uh, April 6, which is when the genocide, April 6, 1994, excuse me, when the genocide uh, officially began. Can you give us a little background on the two groups, the Hutus and the Tutsis? Uh, how did they get uh, organized? How did they get started? What, what did they arise from? Sure. So um, historically, and this is uh, prior to Belgian colonialization, uh, German and Belgian colonialization, pardon, um, they, there was a way of identifying people mostly on what they did in their lives. So the, anyone that did um, agriculture was known as a Hutu, and persons that uh, had cattle uh, were cattle herders uh, were known as Tutsi. And in pre-colonial times, it was possible for one person to move with relative ease from one category to the other, uh, based on your socioeconomic status, perhaps based on your marriage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what happened was when uh, the Germans first came in, but really it was the Belgians after World War I, um, they really made these very rigid categories and they favored the Tutsi over the Hutus because they believed that the Tutsis were superior in, in intellect, but also they could use this small minority to uh, use indirect rule as many colonial powers did um, in Africa and elsewhere. Um, and this created a great deal of... Uh, uh, you know, unrest and feelings of unfa unfairness in the country, um, particularly because they made it almost impossible for you to uh, change your ethnicity from, at that now it became an ethnicity from Hutu to Tutsi. Even though it wasn't an ethnicity at all. That's Just right. a bu bureaucratic not. division. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the other thing that comes to mind about this, um, uh, Tony, is that there was a movie made not, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. The movie was Hotel Rwanda. Yes, um, and it was the story of the uh, failure of the United Nations, who wore nice uniforms and 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 blue hats and whatnot, um, and who did nothing. They left the country to its own devices. This is awful, and then of course the you know the, the violence uh, swept in like the Red Sea. Um, so, but what, why was the United Nations interested, and why did the United Nations fail? Um, to be a, you know, some sort of bulwark against the violence. Yeah, so as I alluded to a bit earlier, uh, at the same time the genocide was going on, there was a civil war. Um, and that civil war had started 
1990. And then in 1992, there was a rough truce, I would say, between the two parties uh, that was ironed out uh, with the help of the international community. And so part of that agreement was that the United Nations would send in peacekeepers uh, into Rwanda to, to try to help maintain the peace. So leading up to the genocide, there were peacekeepers on the ground. But then as you rightly uh, pointed out, Jay, um, instead of actually doing something to try to prevent the genocide uh, or stop some of the worst acts from happening, uh, the United Nations took the decision to pull, the truce, pull all but a few of the peacekeepers out of the country. Um, I think that was an internal decision by the United Nations. I think they were under immense pressure by the United States government. Um, who had been smarted uh, rather uh, badly by Somalia in 1993. So they didn't want another Black Hawk Down situation, as you might remember. Uh -huh. uh, France also did not want uh, peacekeepers there. They wanted um, their nationals evacuated. Uh, and Belgium as well. Belgium had peacekeepers that were killed, um, I believe, on April 7th or April 8th. Uh, Ten Belgian peacekeepers were killed trying to defend the prime minister. Uh, and so I think they also didn't want to spill blood in a, a place like Rwanda where they didn't feel like it was of strategic interest. So the international community really uh, turned their back uh, on Rwanda um, instead of being involved, instead of uh, doing something which might have made a big difference. Um, they basically gave carte blanche to the, the genocide leaders to go ahead. And what about, what about uh, the diplomatic representatives from these various countries who were in Rwanda at the time? Uh, were they were they part of the genocide? Were they killed? Were they at risk? Or did they all leave? The vast majority of them left. There was a big evacuation that was um, organized by the Belgians, by the French, and by the UN themselves uh, to get the diplomatic staffs out, uh, you know, international aid workers, anyone that was in the country to get them out. Um, and that's how they spent their resources in the first, uh, let's say, week, 10 days. Um, after that, there were very few um, foreigners left in, who stayed in Rwanda and left. Um, and, you know, I think the, the diplomatic community in the beginning basically denied what was going on um, or said, you know, there's nothing we can do. This is ancient tribal hatred, um, you know, and it's not as bad as it, it's, you know, as, as it's, that they, it's being portrayed. Um, of course, those became quickly, you know, lies. Why do I feel, why, why, Tony, do I feel that this is relevant? right now relevant in, well, in the context of afghanistan this is this is all a kind of replay of what's going on in afghanistan is it well yes and no i mean i hope to god that what happens in uh, afghanistan doesn't turn out to be a genocide or to have the kinds of killings that you saw in rwanda um in the first hundred days of the genocide uh, nonetheless i think it's uh, it's true that you know it's often when the going gets tough um, you know, powers like the United States don't want to um, stick it out and actually do the right thing. I mean, I would point out in Rwanda, um, there were some things that could have been done very early on that quite possibly could have made a difference. So one thing that was done was there were two main radio stations in the country operating at the time, the national radio station and um, a radio station called uh, Free Television and Radio of a Thousand Hills, the rough translation. And they both broadcast messages day and night about telling people where to go, uh, how to kill them, uh, go finish the work. A lot of it was in euphemisms, but um, you know, just basically telling people where the Tutsis were and how to go kill them and at what time to report. So what was advocated, especially in Washington, is that we, you could have blocked those two radio channels uh, immediately and stopped them from broadcasting. Um, and you know, you know, it was something the, uh, supposedly those in the US government considered doing, but ultimately did not. Um, and so I think in, I bring up this example because that's not something that requires U.S. troops. It's not something that requires you know dead U.N. peacekeepers. It's simply using a little technology to block uh, you know hate radio that was that was really uh, driving genocide. Hate radio with disinformation calling for violence. Yeah. Why do I why do I feel this is not a strange concept in these <laughs> United States? Uh, anyway, let's let's go back to the main point. So, how how was the killing done? Uh, were there you know were sophisticated weapons, or or was this by machete? Uh, the vast major majority of it was done by by with hand weapons, so by machetes and knives. And often, and especially in the beginning, um, the government then in power, the genocidal government, uh, would 
call Tutsis and tell them to go hide, for example, for their own security in churches, um, in community halls, to go to stadiums, and that they would be protected by the government there. Um, and so the government would, would send a small, you know, usually a couple of soldiers and a few police persons, uh, quote unquote, to protect them, but also to prevent them from leaving. And then um, once a large mass of militia members, so these would be mostly young men um, who came in with machetes and knives and et cetera, um, those same um, police and military would turn on the, you know, the crowds of people and use uh, you know, guns and grenades to shoot at them. But then what was called you know, cleanup work, these large groups of militia members were then called in to just hack the people to death. Men, women, and children. Yes, yes, indiscriminate, um, lots of children, um, and many women were, and girls were also uh, victims of rape and sexual violence as well. Often they were raped multi um, repeatedly before they were killed. A state of nature, and the complete dissolution of civilization. Yeah. What, what tragedy. So, okay, so uh, first, I guess, how is Rwanda today? How is the Congo today? Um, is it is it a, a restored to civilized condition or what? Um, in many ways, it is, and it's a remarkable story. Um, I think that the uh, Rwandan Patriotic Front, which was the, the the force that took over after the genocide and installed Paul Kagame as the president, um, has done a remarkable job to rebuild the country. And the country is largely at peace. Uh, infrastructure has been rebuilt. Um, it's improved greatly. Electricity and wa running water are found almost throughout the entire country. Um, so considering it's been less than 25, uh, 25 years, the progress is simply remarkable. Um, and I think Rwanda in many ways is the darling of the you know, international development community because um, there's little corruption. You can projects get finished. Um, there's a sense of you know, this can be done. I think on the flip side, um, it's come at a price. The human, the, you know, the, the ability to uh, talk about human rights abuses committed by those in power now is not tolerated. Political dissent is not tolerated. Certain subjects are not, you're not allowed to speak about in public. Um, and, you will, and if you do, if you dare do so, uh, you may be tried and um, accused of genocidal ideology, but more likely you might just be disappeared and killed. Um, so it's it's a very strange situation if you go to Rwanda today. So we couldn't be having this conversation in public in Rwanda right now. Absolutely not. Is the hotel still standing, the Hotel Rwanda? Yes. So the hotel, um, it's actually called the hotel in real life. It's called the Hotel of a Thousand Hills, as Rwanda is known because it's such a hilly country. And the hotel is right in the middle of the of the city. Um, got refurbished, obviously, after the genocide, and it's still a functioning hotel today. How oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, and you were telling me before the show that in the course of the genocide and the Civil War, um, you know, the country was virtually destroyed, so that the rebuild that took place after, what, 1994 is really uh, miraculous um, because of how little was left after uh, the Civil War and the genocide were finished. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's amazing. And I think if you compare Rwanda to its neighbor, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, almost all almost now all of the roads in Rwanda are paved um, and, you know, are comparable, let's say, to roads in the United States. Um, you only have to cross the border into Congo where you're back on dirt roads, you're on asphalt that's all torn up, potholes everywhere. It's just it's inc it's an incredible night and day situation. What's the international presence there now? You said it was a darling. That sort of implies to me that the international community who essentially abandoned it or actually exacerbated the problem, um, you know, had, had a, I don't know, some kind of reaction to come back and, and try help them. Uh, I guess there's been foreign investment. I guess there's been um, NGOs uh, all around to try to help them rebuild. And so what's, what's the presence today? Yeah, it really was. Um, I think that a number of countries, including the United States, uh, felt terribly guilty about abandoning Rwanda and so came back in force. Um, and it wasn't just the United States, um, obviously, it was many European countries. Um, and so, but the, the presence has changed over time. I think that in the early years, you had a great number of humanitarian um, per personnel who were helping with food delivery, who were helping with medical 
um, you know, basic uh, humanitarian assistance in, in a time of, you know, af after the genocide and after the civil war. Um, that's really switched now. That humanitarian machine, as I call it, is gone because it's no longer needed. And it was replaced by a more classic development, um, development workers, including, you know, the World Bank, the IMF. Um, and I think that, um, you know, to Rwanda's credit, um, they've done quite a good job of managing foreign direct investments, but also uh, grants and loans that have been offered um, by Western powers. So, you know, you often hear about bilateral assistance that goes missing in African country X or African country Y, but Rwanda has been uh, diligent and quite successful in accounting for um, much of the foreign direct aid that's been given, which then encourages, of course, more direct aid. At the same time, you know, it sort of puts a, a hole, if you will, in in the country to have lost half a million people that way yeah. um, in, in tragic and uh, atrocious uh, circumstances. And I wonder how that affects, you know, if you look at uh, Laos, for example, um, how, how that affects uh, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, how that affects the people there. Mm -hmm. um, how does it how does it affect uh, you know, the average person, you know, they say that history is told by the survivors. Well, half a million right. people didn't survive. So what do the survivors think about, you know, what happened? Um, it's that's also it's a very complicated question, obviously, but I think part of what makes it so complicated is that um, what is able to be talked about publicly in Rwanda today is very one sided. So it is true that the previous regime that was a genocidal regime and committed the vast majority of crimes and killings. However, as is often the case in times of war and when two parties are fighting, the other side is not completely um, innocent either. And the RPF was responsible for um, killings, again, much, a much reduced number. Um, but all those things are not, you're not allowed to talk about in Rwanda. So for many people, it's, it feels like one-sided justice and that, that they can't come out and talk about you know, what really happened to them because it might run afoul of what the regime accepts as the, the, the narrative. But don't and you, don't you need to have that? Yeah, I'm, I, I, I take your point. Don't you need to have that to kind of cleanse yourself of all the trouble and hatred and, um, you know, and, and um, what do I call it, uh, concern, sadness, about the killing of all those people. Don't you have to have a, like in other countries in Africa, a truth commission? You know, uh, Project Expedite Justice has participated and encouraged truth commissions in other places, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but there hasn't been one in, in Rwanda, and it doesn't sound like there's going to be one. And so the, the, the view of the average person is kind of skewed. He doesn't really, or she doesn't really understand, uh, can't really process what happened and build it into um, the future of the country. Am I right? Well, I, I would completely agree with what you're saying. And I think that's one of the tragedies of, um, you know, translational justice in Rwanda post-genocide um, in that you had um, and have um, a great deal of resources that was put into the country, um, which we can go to in a minute to, you know, establish justice for the genocide, but also to create reconciliation uh, to create a historical record of what actually happened. Um, and while there has been some justice, I wouldn't I, you know, disagree with that. Obviously, I don't think that the vast majority of people were given the space to really heal because they were unable to talk openly about what happened and to try to find some sort of reconciliation. And um, one of the criticisms of especially the, the national trials um, where people could get reduced sentences if they confessed and apologized um, is that they didn't mean it. And they were only doing this to get, you know, less sentences or maybe not get the death penalty. Uh, but there was no real sense of um, culpability or, you know, I, you know, I, feelings behind the, the apologies. And I think mm. that also has led to resentment by those who um, are victims. Mm -hmm. Well, but uh, you say victims. Uh, it sounded, from your description of what happened, it sounds like there were very few victims. They were all killed. They were all burned, and or rather, uh, they were shot and and, uh, and and hacked and hacked to death. Who who were the victims who were still alive? Well, there. I mean, not all the Tutsis were killed. The numbers in Rwanda are very controversial, and I'm I, I'm not wanting to wade in too much because um, the regime has tried to, in, in my opinion, has tried to inflate the number of 
Tutsis killed in particular. Um, but, you know, there was a, roughly about 25% of Tutsis who survived. Either they managed to escape before the genocide came to their areas of the country, or they hid, or they were um, hidden actually by Hutus, which is another topic we can get into And when you think about uh, trying to account for justice. Uh, but don't forget, there were a number of moderate Hutus that were killed as well. So one of the first things the regime did when they took over the genocidal regime is they killed any moderate poli Hutu politician who they thought um, you know, might be able to sway the public from not going along with the genocide. Um, and that was polit politicians at the national level, but right down to the, you know, the very local um, pro province, commune, hill. Um, and so those people, all their family members, for example, I would call our survivors as well. So there, is, you know, there was a, a, great, a great deal of people who were looking for justice um, and didn't get it. How about the, the two groups today? Is there enmity between them? Is there, you know, bias, prejudice, hatred? Um, how do they get along right now today? It's very, very hard to say because um, one of the things the, the RPF, the new government has done is they've forbidden the use of the terms Hutu and Tutsi and refused to allow them um, on identity cards, for example, or a, a documentation of any kind. So on the one hand, that's a good thing, I think, uh, because, um, you know, what was so successful in the genocide is everyone's ethnicity, either Hutu or Tutsi, was printed on their national ID card. So it was very easy to, to determine who was a Tutsi or, or a Hutu. Um, on the other hand, it's made it very hard because um, there's like an official knowledge that almost everyone in the present regime is a Tutsi. It's not, you can't openly say that. And there's no way of proving it because, you know, there's no documentation that says it. So that has, I believe, has created a great deal of resentment. But because you can't talk about ethnicity in Rwanda today, it's, it's hard to know what, you know, quote unquote, um, ordinary citizens, how they feel about it. Are they, are they conscious of it? You know, are they, do they characterize, you know, you, so you meet somebody, say on a business deal or socially, um, is the average person looking to identify, identity card or not? looking to identify yeah. the other person I think as so. one or the I, other. Yeah. I think so. I think that's true. Yeah. I think well, let's true. talk about the, the, the trials. So there has been of sorts justice with at least three separate tribunals. Uh, can you talk about the, the criminal justice tribunals that have investigated, and I guess you were involved for a time, investigated these matters and taken prosecu prosecution and um, and trial and conviction and punishment. Can you talk sure. about what's been going yeah. on? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, um, I mean, I think the first one is the probably the one that our, our listeners know best, which is the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. So this was set up by the UN Security Council in 1994, uh, specifically to go after and try the ringleaders of the genocide. Um, this was not going to be justice for, you know, ordinary Rwandans, but those who really were led and responsible for the genocide. Um, you know, in the end, the court convicted 85 persons, um, the, the majority of whom were leaders of the genocide. They got the former uh, minister of defense. They got the interim uh, president. Um, they got the head of one of the radio stations I alluded to earlier, et cetera. Um, you know, but the cost was one point, roughly $1.3 billion. Wow. Uh, and it lasted about 15 years. So, you know, I mean, I think for what it did, it, it was effective, but I mean, it was, it's been criticized, of course, uh, both for the cost, uh, the slowness, and it took, especially to get the trials going in the beginning, um, you know, and also because Rwanda was considered unstable in 1994, the UN took the decision that the tribunal should sit in Arusha, Tanzania, so the, you know, Rwanda's neighbor. So what that meant was, especially in the beginning, you know, very, very little information about what was happening in the trials and the tribunal actually made it to Rwanda. Um, as well as logistical nightmares for having, you know, witnesses coming from Rwanda, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think that was one of the, the big drawbacks. Um, the UN got better at it over time um, in, in trying to, they had, a, you know, a media liaison officer now, work, office, sorry, working in uh, Rwanda after a couple of years um, and tried to really use the media in Rwanda to, um, you know, get more information out about what the tribunal was doing. Was it hard to, hard to prove those cases? hard to find people who would actually testify. Um, so I worked on two trials and I can at least speak to the ones I worked on. No, I mean, there were wit witnesses who really wanted to come forward um, and talk about what had happened and, 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 and be part of the process. 
I think that they didn't always understand fully um, what that would mean, what that would look like uh, when they signed up for it. But that was, you know, how, um, you know, from my perspective, it was, it was part of a, a process where they felt like maybe for the first time in their lives, um, they would be able to, they would be listened to and their testimony would bring down, um, you know, one of the big players in Rwanda. So, Were they intimidated? No, not, not to my, uh, you know, not to my knowledge and not as far as what I saw. I really think that, um, you know, they were able to testify in um, Kinyarwanda, which is the local language of Rwanda. So I think that helped. Um, and I, you know, again, um, most of the witnesses that, that I dealt with were, you know, simple farmers who didn't have a lot of education, both men and women. Um, and the fact that you have a, a room full of international persons, including three judges, and, you know, the former governor of your province, uh, all sitting there listening to you. I mean, for many of these people, that was the first time in their lives that anyone really cared what they had to say. Mm -hmm. There was a piece on 60 Minutes yesterday, a very interesting piece about, uh, gee, what country was it? It was another Kenya, Kenya. And mm -hmm. uh, there's a fellow who, um, who talks uh, about justice and he lectures to people in jail. Uh, and uh, they talk about how they 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 uh, represent themselves uh, as lawyers or would be lawyers in front of judges, and it'd be mm -hmm. the first time in their whole lives that anybody ever actually listened to them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's remarkable, you know, and that's it's very powerful. I, I think that it was emotional for a lot of those witnesses, um, especially because you know uh, they were brought on, they were left Rwanda, they were put on a plane for the first time in their life. Um, they were put in a safe house, um, you know, that was up, quote unquote, up to Western standards, et cetera. Um, I do want to share one vignette that I had. We had a witness. So I was in charge of getting a lot of the witnesses, not the logistics part, but just getting them to uh, Arusha. You were there in Rwanda at the time? I was shuttling back and forth between Rwanda and Arusha. Um, and we had a group of four or five on the UN plane. And the woman got quite upset. And through translation, the, the, the story was she, we were flying at night and she was upset because she thought for the first time in her life, she'd be able to see God if she was flying during the day. <laughs> I just thought it was so cute, you know? <laughs> well, we, we live in transitional times, so <laughs> <laughs> transformational times. Well, what kind of punishment came out of that uh, series of trials? The 85, as it, as it sure. as you mentioned. Um, some people got, some of the accused got life in prison. Others got uh, sentences. Any, to my knowledge, the largest one was 30 years and the smallest one was 10, but I have to check some of those figures. So, you know, roughly between 10 and 30 years and life for um, some of the ringleaders. Um, and I think that was very, uh, that was considered controversial as well, at least because initially in Rwanda, uh, they had the death penalty and a number of, uh, I would say much lesser uh, responsible persons got, uh, you know, put to death in Rwanda, um, including in, in public executions. Um, so that was one of the big sticking points, I think, for Rwanda. Now, it's true that Rwanda has since repealed the death penalty. Um, and so that's no longer, a, um, you know, a, a, a sentence for people accused of genocide or anything else. Well, that's a, that's a good development. Mm -hmm. So what about the, the, so that was one trial you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. um, the, the criminal, criminal court in Rwanda, but there were other other courts. Can you talk about the other courts that were addressing sure. uh, these these atrocities? And and can you tell me why this was spread amongst all these courts? When uh, you know one would ask, why not have only one court, Nuremberg, right. for example? Right, right. Well, I think that the, the the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda had very specifically said from the beginning they were only going to go after ringleaders, and they didn't have the the, the capacity or um, I guess the willingness to you know have, to take to take on the number of people accused of genocide. So the, there were two things that were happening uh, soon after in Rwanda. The first thing is um, you know there were the, the rebuilding of the national court system. So think very much along the lines of the criminal justice system in the United States. You have prosecutors, you have eventually defense lawyers, you have judges. Um, and Rwanda tried, um, I think it's up to now 10,000 persons accused of genocide through these, what I call, you know, traditional law courts. Um, but what happened was, um, I think the largest number was in 1998, you had over 100, 130,000 people in prison accused of genocide in Rwanda. And at that point, you had just a little over 1,000 trials that had gone forward. 
So I think one of the things that the, the government realized quickly on is there was no way they would be able to try all those pe people who were in prison and accused. Um, the prisons themselves were hopelessly overcrowded and a lot of prisoners were dying of communicable disease. So what the government did is this third uh, system of justice is they created what's called gachacha. So gachacha was traditionally um, you know, a reconciliation um, method that was done very locally on, on you know, at the very the, the hill level, at the people's homes and their communities for minor offenses, for insults. You know, this was um, just basically you know, a reconciliation tool. But what the government did is they sort of reimagined this, that now all communities across Rwanda could come together and try uh, genocide suspects, which is what they did. Um, and it was just, you know, it's what they would do is they would elect judges, like quote unquote judges. These were people um, who may or may not have any legal skill at all, but were respected by the community to come forward and act as judges. And then a, a different accused from that community would be brought out of jail. And then everyone was asked to come forward and talk about what they knew about that person, whether they're guilt or innocence. Um, so it was the scope was unbelievable. This happened everywhere across the country over a period of a number of years. Um, they they heard something like two million cases. Um, you know, they were able to, for some people, to get justice as they were accused. You know, were were rightly accused of genocide and, and might otherwise might otherwise have Which, a trial. And justice is punishing the fellow who is accused of the crime. It's right. not a it's not a money damage thing, is it? No, it was not. There was no reparations ever given. Yeah. Um, so I mean, there were lots of positive things about it, but I think you know because of the way it was done. Uh, some people were falsely accused, and you know I, I take the, the the point of what you were saying earlier. When five hundred thousand people have been killed, and another two million have fled the country, you know the the community that's left may or may not even be the people that were there during the genocide, and that's what happened in some places where you had a lot of people who were like, "We're not from here. We don't know what happened," um, and yet a lot of people were convicted on you know hearsay. And you know, some someone that may or may not have um, you know an axe to grind with that person or their family. So there were a lot of cases of abuse as well. It wasn't a perfect system, but I think it did, in a way, um, obviously depopulate the um, the prisons and the and, and places of incarceration, um, and it did provide justice for some people. Well, this is so interesting, especially in the context of what's going on now. I mean, yeah. not not in not only in Afghanistan, but in other places too. Um, so I guess um, one more question, and then I'd like to ask you a larger question. <clears throat> and that is why my last my last uh, question at this point is, uh, why didn't the Criminal Court of Justice in The Hague get involved? If you have war crimes and atrocities, usually uh, somebody goes to The Hague and, and we have cases there. Is there a reason that didn't happen here? Uh, yes, actually there is, because at the time of the creation of the Rwanda Tribunal, the International Criminal Court didn't exist. So you'll remember um, these, they were called ad hoc tribunals that were set up. There was one in Yugoslavia, the ICTY. There was one in Rwanda, the ICTR. And it was through this, this realization, I think, by parties to the UN um, and to the Rome Statute, which eventually created the International Criminal Court, uh, that it was uh, bureaucratic, it was wasteful to keep having ad hoc tribunals, better to have a permanent International Criminal Court in The Hague. So in a way, the ICTR and the ICTY uh, you know, predated the, the ICC, which I think came into force in 1999 or 2000, I can't remember. Uh, are we done? Are we done with these trials? Are we done with, um, <clears throat> you know, various uh, prosecutions in various courts um, against people who committed these, these murders? Uh, we're pretty much done. The ICTR has folded their work. They're no longer functioning. Uh, the Gatacha, this was the community justice I spoke about. Uh, that was finished in 2012. That's no longer happening. Occasionally, there will be, for example, a, a genocide suspect that's uncovered in the third country. So for ha perhaps, let's say, you know, hiding in the Congo that gets arrested in the Congo and then is turned over to Rwanda. So there is still the possibilities for some uh, trials in the national courts in Rwanda, but we're, you know, it's basically over. And I think that... Um, you, know, you have to think I was, I mean, just an anecdote to share, you know, I was on a bus in Rwanda, not that long ago, two years ago, just before COVID. 
Um, and I was kind of looking around and I was like, I think almost everyone on this bus, you know, is, was born after the genocide, which was a little shocking to me. But, you know, Rwanda, like so many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the, you know, the vast majority of the population is under the age of 20. Um, you know, so it's, it's just that it's the country itself is, is, has kind of moved on as well in terms of just the population. You know, sometimes you don't appreciate that, like the point is made about Afghanistan. We've been, the United States has been there 20 years. Well, most of the country was born right. <laughs> after the United right. States got there. there. I mean, yeah. We don't realize how young people are and, um, yep. and that changes the way you look at things. And that's my, this is my last question, my 50,000 foot question here. You know, <clears throat> this, is, this is really an awful experience. It's mm -hmm. not unique, but it, it is unique in some ways for sure. In the, in the numbers and the, the strange origin of the of the contention um, and, and the strange the strange steps that followed it and the fact that it's being muzzled right now for reasons that are not completely clear to me but my question to you tony is what what have we learned from what happened here you know the the world has to be a better place um, we have to find ways to avoid this but also mm -hmm. to heal after it happens, because it's still happening. Um, what, what would you leave with our viewers uh, on the lessons from Rwanda, uh, from the genocide, uh, from the, the courts that followed the genocide, from the country that emerges from all of that now? What can we apply in other circumstances, other countries, other atrocities? Yeah, I, well, I think at least two things come to mind. I mean, the first is that, you know, as I alluded to earlier, there were some simple steps the international community could have done uh, to at least mitigate some of the worst atrocities, if not stop the genocide altogether. Um, and that was, like I said, blocking the radio broadcasts and broadcasts that were sending out daily hate messages and telling people where to go and get killed. Um, so it's not always that easy, and it's sometimes in hindsight, but I, I think the lesson learned there is simply that you can't just abandon a country um, in its time of need, when clearly a genocide is, is unfolding, um, and wash your hands of it. Um, morally, it's incorrect, it's you know, ethically wrong, but it's also, and it doesn't mean I'm advocating for armed intervention, but I think there are steps that states can do uh, to send a strong signal that you know, such action is not acceptable and will be, one will be accountable for it after the fact, at the very least. Um, so I would start there. I, I think the other thing that's, it's, that's been both um, apparent but still problematic in uh, you know, post-genocide justice in Rwanda is the one-sided nature of the narrative. Um, and so what I you know, alluded to earlier is the you know, crimes committed by the RPF, you know, much smaller in scale. Um, I'm not comparing them to the, you know, the genocidal acts of the previous regime, but crimes committed nonetheless need to be accounted for. And the ICTR never touched a case of the, of the crimes committed by the RPF, although they could have. Uh, national courts never have, oh, excuse me, a, a few military courts have, but they're very small number of cases. And the Gatacha, they were not allowed to talk about it as well. If you tried to talk about it, uh, you were shut down immediately and sometimes imprisoned. So, you know, there's a gaping hole there. If you're, if you're thinking about healing, if you're thinking about true reconciliation, uh, to me, you've got to have a full accountability of what, ha of what happened. Um, and you can't have that if part of the narrative is suppressed and left out. Mm. One last point you mentioned this a minute ago is, is there's, um, there's a question, and it, it exists today, certainly, even right now, in connection with um, you know, uh, Afghanistan. So what, what do you think the, the nature of the obligation of the international community is? to step into a deteriorating situation, one which could very well lead to genocide. Uh, is there an obligation? Should you know, the world mm, get together and take action of some kind um, to affirmatively avoid the total deterioration of the state of, of some countries? Mm -hmm. No, I think there is an there's an obligation, and I think the you know if you if you look at the the, the ideals of what the United Nations was supposed to, is supposed to be, um, and our just our basic obligation as, as human beings, you know, you just can't leave a country um, in its time of need because it doesn't have geo uh, geopolitical importance to you, or it doesn't have oil reserves, or whatever the reason that you know the country may or may not be interested to a third party. I think that if it's clear what there are steps that can be taken. 
uh, to mitigate a looming disaster, then I think the burden is on all of us to do something about it, nation states, but individuals. Um, so yeah, I think that that's clear. Thank you, Tony. Tony Tate, Project Expedite Justice. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for your comments. And uh, thank you for teaching us what happened there. Aloha. Thank you, Jay. I really ap appreciated this time and I've enjoyed the conversation. Same here. Aloha. Okay. Take care.